So I wanted to thank y'all for the opportunity to come and serve. It's a big blessing to be here and to be able to present God's Word. I'm pretty excited. Uh, I want to shout out to Pastor PJ and Christy. I hope that they're enjoying the cruise. Amen. And hopefully PJ was able to find falafels on the cruise and get his fill. Right? Um, maybe he got some yesterday at lunch and he's enjoying them today. <laughs> Uh, so a few months ago, whenever Pastor PJ and I spoke, um, he told me about this tour portion. And so I read through it, and I'm like, this is amazing. This is directly applicable to my life, um, exactly what I've been going through. Um, so I'm, again, I'm just really excited about this. So I want to give you a quick recap about last week, uh, Genesis 31 in particular. What happened was we saw uh, Jacob operated... Uh, quite a bit of business knowledge, but a lot of business wisdom. He was able to multiply uh, his livestock quite a bit. Uh, but we also see that there was a little bit of unrighteousness there. Not necessarily in the letter, because he did what he said he was going to do, but more in the spirit of how he conducted business. Uh, so much to the point that he noticed that his father-in-law's countenance had been shifted towards him. And he stole away, is what the word says, because he was afraid um, so he was on his journey running from Laban for about three days before Laban, uh, Laban heard about it. And then Laban pursued him for seven days before he caught up to him. So that means Laban was pursuing him right through Shabbat. He's like, I don't care, I've got to find my daughters and that guy that took them and all my riches as well. <laughs> and uh, so whenever Laban finally caught up with him, he's like, what are you doing? Why are you running away from me? And why'd you take my graven images? And Laban, or not Laban, uh, Jacob immediately vocalized what was going on. He's like, man, I thought you were going to take your daughters back. Like, I'm sure he was concerned he's going to take his life too. But he knew he had done wrong and he was running from it. And I think that we can relate to that, that oftentimes we don't know how to deal with an issue that we've caused. And so we kind of hide it or cover it up or deflect I found out what's really interesting whenever I read that, though, again, is that whenever Laban asked him, hey, what'd you do with my graven images? Jacob said, we don't have your graven images. Look through all of our stuff. Look through my whole company. In fact, I know we don't have your graven images. So much to the point that he, went, he, moved, he shifted into pride, right? He was operating in fear, and then he shifted into pride. He said, if you find a graven image, off with his head. Whoever has it. I mean, he's operating in extreme, right? Uh... And then Laban searched through all his company, couldn't find it. And, Lab and uh, Jacob responded by lashing out at Laban. Hey, by the way, here's the record of wrongs that you've done me. You know, I didn't sleep for days. I was shivering outside with all your flock. I served you twice to win your daughters. And you've changed my wages so many times. Like, he just had this record of wrongs. He just went off on them. And I think we can all relate to that, right? Whenever we're operating in fear, we operate in... And a couple of different extremes, typically. You've heard of fight or flight. And so at first, Jacob flew, right? Like he was like, I'm going to run away. Uh, and at, at some point, he became angry, right? Became angry with his father-in-law. But he was also insecure because he knew he had done wrong. So when he found a point that, hey, I can stand here on the letter. I didn't take any of your graven images. I'm going to operate in pride. And we see that pretty commonly, right? The folks that struggle the most with being prideful are frequently the ones that are most insecure. Like, so it's just interesting to see that dynamic. I had a pretty neat quote from Norman Reedus. The dog with the loudest bark are the ones that are the most afraid. Yes. What are the most vicious dogs? Just those little wiener dogs, right? Just about bite your toe off. I'm like, I didn't do anything to you. <laughs> So I got a pretty interesting story. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I decided to submit to um, all the prepper teachings, right? That, hey, the world's about to fall apart. Do everything you can to prepare. Like, you need to be able to generate electricity. You need to generate clean water. You need to have enough food stored up or be able to grow your own food. And so uh, at that time, we, ha we weren't living um, in financial freedom. We weren't operating uh, and managing our money well. And... What's interesting, like I, I was in fear that the world's about to fall apart. You know what? It's going to be during Sukkot when we see that moon, when we see the sliver, like that's when, or right, whenever it's full, like halfway, right after we see the sliver. Uh, the world's going to fall apart. And so we didn't have the money. We, yeah, we got by for Sukkot. 
But I considered, because I was operating in such fear, we considered it's a blessing from God. It's God's provision that I've got $3,500 of space left on my credit card. So I think that this is God's way of providing for me. I need to burn that $3,500 and store it in food in my house. Because I'll be able to take all that with me, right? <laughs> yes, and I've got to pay that back as well. So I just thought it was interesting. Like I justified something that was really unreasonable simply because I was walking in fear. And I think we can all relate to that sometimes, right? Most of the time it's not till after the fact. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, uh, next thing I wanted to bring up was that Jacob met with God, right? He was in fear, um, running from Laban. He settled that. And then uh, Genesis 32, 1 and 2. So Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's camp. And he called the name of that place Menahinim. I think it's really interesting because I, I personally found that whenever I seek the Father with my whole heart, that's when I feel the most confident in who I am. And uh, we see the same exact thing with Jacob, right? He, he sought the Father. He met with the Father. God was ministering to him with his angels. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to name this place. That's right. I can name this place. And, uh, he's just operating in confidence. I just thought it was wonderful. But the very next thing happened. He looked on the road ahead. He's like, ah, I got to walk by that guy that said he wants to kill me. Just a couple of chapters ago, my brother Esau said, I will kill Jacob. So he got back on the journey, realized, hey, I've got, I've got to pass by Esau. We see that in Genesis 32, verse 3. And then in verse 7, we see that Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. But what this is really neat is that Jacob went to his knees in that time of distress, that time of fear. I think we can all relate to that, right? I mean, we've had several testimonies about that just today, that whenever we're struggling... That's normally whenever we come to our knees. And I, I mean, you're exactly right, Miss Fran. Like, we need to be able to praise God in the good times and seek Him in the bad times, right? So I wanted to bring up uh, his response. We know that he was in fear. There's this guy that wants to kill him. And whenever we read that story, we see that Jacob was overwhelmed with fear. Like, to the point that he walked through all of his possessions and it says that everything that came to his hand, everything that was according to his flesh, he thought he should give to Esau. Hey, I'm going to do it. And so he gave like five, over 550 livestock. And by the way, we've got a friend that raises sheep, lambs, and they say that certified sheep cost about $350 a piece. So he had 220 uh, sheep and he had camels and, ca and, uh, yeah, and cows and rams. He had all sorts of livestock. And let's just say that if we wanted to convert this to modern times, $350 a piece would be the bare minimum. Like some cows are worth a grand, right? $350 times 550. He just gave Esau, he's planning to give Esau over $192,000 in today's currency, right? But that's incredibly conservative. It could easily be twice that. So, okay, so we, we see now also, Jacob is loaded. And how many of us have pursued finances thinking, that's where I'm going to be in peace? Once I'm loaded, once I have all the fun money that I need, then I'll be at peace. Like, it's so common, right? But it's interesting to see even a God that's, God literally changed his name, we'll read about later. He struggled with the same thing, thinking, hey, I'll be secure. But the, the money didn't make him secure. It didn't bring the security. So I want to run through a quick exercise too. Let's say that Jacob's uh, offering to his brother was just 20% of all of his wealth, his net worth. So that's still quite a bit of money. But let's say that your net worth is 120 grand. Let's assume that your house is paid off, all your cars are paid off. Let's say your net worth is 120 grand. What's 20% of 120 grand? It's one fifth. Anybody, somebody pull out a calculator. $24,000. So let's say, good job, thank you. Let's say that your net worth is $120,000 and you're like, I'm going to give a fifth of it, I'm going to give 20% of it to this guy that wants to take my life because I want to win his heart. So you're going to give him twenty four grand. All right, so that's still a pile of money. I mean, you could buy a car with that. 
Uh, but what if it's only one twentieth of his net worth? Like either way, like that would be six grand. So I'm just trying to put it in perspective. Like Jacob made a sacrifice without a doubt. We get he was loaded, but he still made a sacrifice. He still was like, you know what? I'm going to give up some of everything I've earned because I don't want to die. I want to please this guy. He, we see a pattern here, right? He was operating in an extreme mindset because he was operating in fear. No. Uh, a couple years ago, whenever... Anybody remember Hurricane Irma? Oh, good God. <laughs> I mean, the, the meteorologists, the news, they were like all over the place. What coast is it going up? When's it coming? How fast is it going? Uh, and just to be honest, I was paralyzed in fear. I didn't recognize it, though. I, I called Pastor PJ one day. I'm like, Pastor PJ, what are you doing? How are you preparing for the storm? Are you going to leave? Are you going to evacuate? Nah, man, I'm just driving around making sure my boats are anchored. I'm getting some propane because I don't want to cook with a fire. I'd rather, I don't want to make a fire. I'd just rather use propane. I can survive. No big deal. Like, he's at peace. And I'm like, I don't even know what to do because I, I'm in the middle of so many projects at work and my wife is pregnant. My, my baby's due in like a month or three weeks. Like, I, I don't even know where to go. Like, we're all set up with the midwife in St. Augustine. Like, I didn't know what to do when Hurricane Irma was here. And I was operating in big fear, for sure. And I was influencing my wife to operate in fear, too, and she's pregnant. <laughs> yeah, it's the wrong thing. <laughs> so at the last moment, really, whenever the meteorologists or the news are saying the hurricane's coming, I'm like, honey, let's pack up the house. We've got a little trailer. Let's just pack everything that we don't want to leave behind in case our place gets wiped out. Let's, let's pack everything we don't want to leave behind in the trailer, and we'll take off. Um, so we were in so much fear that we're evacuating Florida, like planning on that. And I told my wife, you drive separately so we can take more stuff. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, so literally we were taking two different vehicles to go out of the state. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm in fear of losing my stuff, my junk. Uh, I'm in fear of like, what to do with the, my pregnant wife. And um, on top of that, I was highly irritable, right? Um, I mean, my wife can testify that like, mad mood swings when you don't sleep for 27 hours or so because you're packing up your house at the last minute because you're in fear of a hurricane coming to take you out. Um, so I know that I didn't speak kindly to my children. I didn't speak kindly to my wife. Uh, I wasn't too happy with the way people were not driving. They were just parked in the middle of the interstate. <laughs> and we can all relate to this. So uh, I want to bring up a pretty neat quote by a guy named Dan Moeller. He said, if you're a Christian for the benefits, then you may become discouraged or fearful if some aspect of your life doesn't seem like it's doing well. Yeah. That hit my heart for sure. So just keep in mind that despite your circumstances, you're no less anointed by God. You're no less His child. You're no less in covenant with Him. Um, I remember whenever I met Christine in college, Found out as much as I could about her. Like, hey, what's your favorite flower? A lily? I've never heard of a lily. Somebody liking a lily so much. And she's like, yeah, there's this verse in Proverbs, a lily among the thorns. I'm like, oh, okay. And so guess what? I found some roses and I found a lily. And I'm like, hey, I'm going to arrange them in a heart shape and put the lily right in the middle. And I got spoke with her dad. I got a key to the house so I could do all this. So when she walked in the door, she could see all this. I'm like, I'm going to win her heart, right? Because she's my lily among the thorns, even though she won't put a title over us. She won't be in relationship with me. She'll only be a friend. But I still wanted to win her heart, right? If y'all, has anybody heard of something called drip marketing? All right, so I, I, I did everything I could to slowly influence her, right? Like, I'm like I have this, uh, this water. I'm just kind of dripping on her all the time. Hey, don't you know I'm here? Don't you know I'm thinking about you? I mean, some of it's artificially flavored, some of it's naturally colored, but like either way I'm just trying to let her know I'm here and I want you, honey. I didn't call her honey at the time, but I was just trying to say I wanted her, right? Um, so I was writing love notes to her or like notes or I was putting notes on her car that said, hey, guess what Bible verse I'm reading today? Like I know that she wanted a godly man and so I'm like, I've got to show her that I'm a godly man because then she's going to want me, right? That's what it is. That's why she doesn't, that's why she won't put a title over us. <laughs> Love you too, Miss Mary. <laughs> so I would surprise her outside of her class. Uh, I, I'm not sure if she was surprised. She may have been like shocked, like when are you going to go away? But I was, either way, I just wanted to be with her. 
And on top of that, like I was trying to influence her parents. Like I remember one time, um, uh, her parents were moving into a new house in San Augustine, and uh, they said there was some snake in the backyard or something. And I'm like, I said, I got my pocket knife. I I'll take care of it, no problem. And I'm going to take care of this snake. It's a six foot moccasin. You know, the ones that, like when they open their mouth, it's white and they got the blunt tail. And, but I'm just operating in extreme because I'm like, this is what I want. It's like, I don't care about anything else. I want her. Uh, like, I was passionate about what I wanted, right? Did you kill it? Yeah. I did use a hoe to help me, though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I wanted to show you how Jacob also used drip marketing. So if we see uh, in Genesis 32, 16, it says, Then he delivered them into the hands of his servants. Every drove by itself. And he said to his servants, Pass over before me and put some distance between successive droves. So we know that he picked out over 550 livestock. Then all we know, it could have been his choice livestock that he picked. He's like, hey, I'm going to send this group. A couple hours later, I'm going to send the next group. Like he's just going to overwhelm his brother. Like he's going to be like, wow, why is Jacob sending me a couple hundred livestock and some people? And another couple hundred? What is going on? Like he's just trying to overwhelm his brother. He's doing everything he can in his flesh, just like I was, to acquire his desire, to acquire the heart of his brother. He doesn't want to get killed. So we see, uh, again, Jacob was overwhelmed, uh, and he was just trying to woo his brother. So I want to show you a pattern that uh, I was able to, praise God, I noticed in Jacob's life in both chapters 31 and chapter 32. So first of all, we, we see that Jacob is focused on circumstances in his life. Right? The, the first time it's running from Laban because Jacob made the bad decision to be slightly deceptive over a long period of time and he could see some repercussions coming. And so he got scared. He's like, I gotta flee. Like, I'm sure he sought God. That's why God said, go back home to mom. That's what God said. Right? Go back to the, hand, the land of your mom and dad. Go back to your safety net. He was emotionally weighed down. He got overwhelmed. And even with this situation with Esau, he responded to the circumstance with his flesh. That's what it says. Everything that came to his flesh, he set aside to send in droves, drip marketing to his brother. Like he's trying to win the heart of his brother. And then we also see that he seeks God's presence, he remembers his identity, and then he's able to walk in confidence. Like this happens repeatedly. But he walks in confidence for maybe a moment and then looks up at distraction again. Or looks up at a circumstance. So, now what do I do? So this is kind of a repeated cycle. It's pretty interesting. I can directly relate to it. Um, has anybody ever thought that your spouse has a menstrual cycle or a monthly cycle even if they're not female? <laughs> All right. So I'm confident my wife has had that thought about me. And I praise God for this Torah portion, right? Because it showed me why. It's because I've been in this cycle pretty much all my life. I'm trying not to get ahead of myself here. Getting a little excited. So we see Jacob got alone to meet with God. In Genesis 32, 24. Uh, that's where it starts. Where Jacob started to pursue God. God met with him. And he wrestled with God throughout the night. What's interesting is that we know he was in a tremendous amount of fear. This is probably the most fear Jacob has ever been in in all of his life. And uh, I think this verse in Proverbs is pretty, pretty applicable. It says, Anxiety in a man's heart, in a person's heart, weighs him down. But a kind word cheers him up. Like That's kind of the... It's kind of a blessing, really, if you think about it. Like, if you're in fear to the point that it drives you to your knees just so you can spend time on your face before God, like, that kind of seems like a blessing. But it's interesting truth, though, right? Because that's what we've all... We heard several testimonies just this morning that whenever we're in a, a low place or difficult place, that's when we're seeking the Father. Uh, we see right before verse 24 that Jacob kind of separated from his family. Like he sent his wives that way, his servants another way. He's like, hey, y'all go on ahead of me. Go ahead and cross over before me. And it, that's when God started to wrestle with him. That's when God met him. So we're going to read through those verses real quick. It says, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. 
And now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. So sometimes we pursue God for benefit instead of for transformation. Or for blessing instead of life change. And that's what I want to point out in verse 26. That's what Jacob says. He says to God, I will not let you go. He's holding on to God with all of his heart. That's, I think we've done that, all that, done that before, right? Like we'll spend time fasting from food, from water, from sleep. Because we want to hear direction from God. Right? So this is a common occurrence. That we are seeking God for blessing. For benefit instead of for transformation. Or we're seeking God for blessing instead of for life change. So what's really interesting about this situation is that God wants to share with us a different message this time. There's a, a neat quote by Dan Muller. Says, he says, Faith is a perspective you live by, not a toolkit to help you get by. But I can testify that I have lived all of, all of my Christian life using God as a toolkit to help me get by, as opposed to giving me a new identity. So we see that Jacob has literally been born again. Like God has given him a new name and said, you are now going to rule as God. Operate in confidence. Your identity has come from me now. Quit depending on your circumstances to determine your identity. But I'm telling you, you're born again. I just think it's so phenomenal. So the typical understanding of Christianity is that God is helping me to make it through life instead of his life coming in me so I can follow him, shine like he would shine, and walk like he would walk. So Jim Quick says something pretty cool. He says, For a moment, acknowledge and honor all that you are instead of all that you are not. So I would like to share with you how to re-enter your mother's womb, how to be reborn, how to be born again. So I'd like to help you Teach yourself to stop loving, to stop living by how you feel. But operate in faith. Right? The word says that the just lives by, not by willpower and discipline. Right? So there's three simple steps. The first step is to speak life. So this might seem like a simple concept. And it's completely intended as that. I think the father's yoke is easy and light. I'm going to read some verses to you. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Proverbs 18.21 A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in your tongue breaks the spirit. Proverbs 15.4 But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. Matthew 15.18 This is James 3, 3 through 6. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us. And we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a, uh, a, little, for a little fire kindles. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. Again, that's James 3, 3 through 6. So we see the power of the tongue. We see why it's important to speak life, not to speak death. Second step is to practice control of our emotions. So Zig Ziglar has a pretty cool quote. He says, Fear has two meanings. These are acronyms. Forget everything and run. It's four letters. Or face everything and rise. The choice is yours. Mark Twain says courage is resistance to fear or mastery of fear. It's not the absence of fear. Who here wants to master fear? Right, who, who's been mastered by fear in the past? Everybody say never again. Never, never again. All right. 
So here's a lie. This is a very interesting. How you're doing is how you're... Sorry, I said that backwards. How you're feeling is how you're doing. So I got an example. How do you typically respond when somebody says, How are you doing today? Most of us respond by telling that person how we feel. Well, this just happened to me, and I've got this struggle at work, and my wife's mad at me again, and our, I'm too far in debt, or whatever the struggle is. We, we respond by saying how we feel as opposed to how we're doing. But the truth is, what you're believing, what you're believing in your heart, that's how you're doing. Right? So if, if your circumstances are independent of your identity, if you've been born again, now the circumstances aren't going to change how you're doing. That's where power and authority comes from. That's where, how you can operate in confidence. So Dan Moeller says something pretty neat. He says, oh, here's an example. He's like, well, what, what if you're saying, how, I don't feel loved. I don't feel loved by God. How about this concept? It's because you don't believe that you are loved through the cross. You're waiting for some circumstance in your life to prove to you that you're loved. But in reality, God's already done it. He's already died on the cross for you. He's already proved his love. Dale Carnegie says, Fear does, does not exist anywhere except in your mind. Proverbs 29.18 says, Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps my Torah. We mentioned that earlier, right? When we talked about the extremes that we tend to operate in whenever we're struggling with fear. Proverbs 23.7 says, As a man thinketh in his heart... I'm going to do it the way my kids do. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. <laughs> For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Luke 17, 21. So God is saying that we can operate in His presence. We can operate in heaven, the kingdom of God, because it's within us. So we've all heard Him say that, or read that He said, uh, the kingdom of God is at hand. He says it's within you as well. So the third step... Oh, did I... I may have forgotten to read this. So the first step, speak life. Second thing is, we're going to practice control of our emotions. All right, and the third thing is, we're going to walk with purpose. So I just want to be clear for a, point, for a moment. There's a difference between operating with ambition and operating with vision or purpose. So vision or purpose will be from God, and that will make a positive impact on the community. That will make a positive impact on building God's kingdom. Ambition, on the other hand, is not necessarily sin, but just keep in mind that ambition is not vision or purpose from God. So ambition could look like, I want a big house, fancy cars, I want nice clothes. So there's nothing wrong with that unless you love it. But just keep in mind, that's not the same thing as vision or purpose. So in Luke chapter 10, Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but only one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken from her. So it doesn't matter the circumstances. Yeah, the food's not ready, the kitchen's a mess, we haven't swept the floor in three days, and Yeshua's here. It doesn't matter. What, what's more important? Like me jumping all over my wife's case because there's diapers and there's clothes on the floor and the kitchen's a mess? Like, what? Why would I be upset with her? I've been working for 80 hours this past week. I haven't even been home. She's got five kids under eight years old. Why would I be... That doesn't make any... Why would I get upset with her? I mean, my identity hasn't changed. So if I'm now getting upset with her about that, that means that I'm seeking identity through my circumstances as opposed to seeking... finding my identity only through my Messiah. Like, I'm no less anointed by God. I'm no less filled with His Spirit, despite if there's two or 16 diapers on the floor. It doesn't matter. Like, so if I'm letting that affect me, then that should be a trigger. Hey, I'm in the wrong. So the reason why life is a grind or a struggle oftentimes is because we're living life outside of why we're here. We're pushing against the grain of purpose, and we're trying to make life work for ourselves instead of using God 
Sorry, we're trying to make life work, work for ourselves and we're using God to help us in that selfish endeavor. That's by Dan Moeller. He also says, he uses an analogy of a, of a baby and a pacifier. Now, every now and again, the, the baby's upset. Ah! You put a pacifier in the baby's mouth, what happens? Quiet. Quiet. All right, so... He says, we have been self-driven, self-centered, self-conscious, self-defending, self-protecting from the time we can remember. Right? We were taught that as a baby. But the cross is saying, it wasn't about you from the beginning. So die to it all so you can live to the truth. That's coupled with the fact that even in the Messianic movement, we preach a gospel that benefits ourselves. And we keep this selfishness lie alive in the whole process. So it's this, this compounding effect. We're not overcoming this lie that it's, it's about us. So through this, we, we still struggle. We work together. And we might learn how to do great church. But we might not, not actually ever become her. Because we're so focused on self. Miles Monroe says... Once you have a vision, once you know your purpose, opposition is simply a test of your resolve. But it won't, it won't stop you. Opposition could be circumstances. If you know who you are, you know what your purpose is to build God's kingdom, and you have unfavorable circumstances, are you going to let that stop you from being His light, from being His love, even to your enemy? Tony Robbins says, focus on where you want to go, not on what you fear. Imagination is God's gift to you. To take a tour of your future, come back, and then make plans to go there. This is Miles Monroe. So I think that uh, we've all thought about what life could be. You know what, if we were living in community, or if my, my husband or my spouse would just follow God or pursue God, if, if my kids would just come to live for the Father above the selfishness of themselves. But in reality, like we have all the power that we need to be able to make a plan to get there. And I think part of that is knowing that your identity doesn't come from those circumstances. Revelation twelve seventeen says, And the dragon was enraged with a woman. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commands of God and have the testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach. So if you know where you're going, you will have a sense of security and passion. So I've got a, I showed you another diagram. That it's a cycle. I have a new one to show you uh, that is based on if you know where your identity comes from. Apologize for the small print. If you're seeking God's presence, you know who you are, then you're walking in confidence, and you can have purpose in every action that you take. Despite being in the middle of circumstances. The blue square is supposed to be circumstances. So we all, all have different circumstances in our life. With family, with work. So the typical understanding of Christianity is that God is helping me to make it through my life. Instead of his life coming in me so I can follow him, shine like he would shine and walk like he would walk. I'm repeating that on purpose. So if you're a Christian for the benefits, then you may become discouraged if some aspect of your life doesn't seem like it's doing well. And this is why Yeshua said to seek first the kingdom of God and to love less everything else in life. So that no part of life would prevent his light from shining through you. This is Dan Moeller saying this. So I have an opportunity for y'all. Uh, this is pretty profound information to me. If you would like for me to send you all these scriptures, all my notes, just send a text message ID to that phone number, 386-227-6057. I'll send you the written outline of this teaching, all the scripture references, all the quotes, the PowerPoint. And I got a cool video to send you as well. Um, if you want to take it to another level, if you want 
assistance with learning who you are, learning to walk in your identity despite your circumstances, text the same phone number, but the word ID assist, and I'd be happy to join you on a call, to schedule an in-person meeting, to help you figure out your purpose, and to be able to walk in it. As well as I'll send you all the resources too. Dan Muller says, you could be born again. You could see your need for a savior and yet simultaneously have a motive or a fear in your life that is contrary to the kingdom of God and literally working against everything that God desires for you. So in uh, Genesis 35, verse 1, God gives instructions to Jacob. He says, go to Bethel and dwell there. He's basically saying, go back to the place where you met God and stay there. Like, who wants to go back to the place where we met God? Right? Like, a, not necessarily a physical place, but it's a spiritual place, right? Where we gave up. Or maybe it wasn't when you met God that you came to that place, but maybe it was, because I think Jacob had already known God before. So maybe he found God in a more intimate way than he ever had before. He realized how much he was valued at that moment. All right, Genesis 35, verse 2. Jacob gives instructions to his company. He says, put away the foreign gods from among you. So at first, this was a little bit hard for me to relate to. But then I realized, what's he really saying? He's saying, put away your pacifiers and clean up. There you go. Like some of us have pacifiers of alcohol or of pornography or of working too much or pursuing material things or affirmation of man. But Jacob recognized that he's got these issues or his company has these issues and said, you know what? We're done with this stuff. Put it all away. And then verse 7 says, Then God appeared to him, to Jacob, when he fled from the face of his brother. Sorry, I said that backwards. There God appeared to him when he, fed, he fled from the face of his brother. So if we recall, this is this Bethel, this place was paramount for Jacob in terms of being in fear. He thought he was going to lose his life. He did everything in his power, fleshly power, to win the heart of his brother Esau. And when he got back to that place, spiritually, God was there again. And what's interesting is that what God does is remind him of who he is. When he got back to the same place, and God said to him again, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Also God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed, shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you, and to your descendants after you I give this land. So it's interesting that whenever we move back into the place of full surrender, God reminds us of who we are. We can operate in confidence. The word says that God again, that uh, Jacob again named that place Bethel. Which is interesting. He immediately started operating in confidence again. Hey, just to make sure everybody knows, this place is called Bethel. It, gets, it repeats it, right? Just in case everybody doesn't know. So... I started a new business back in June and up until end of October I think I'd only had about 11 or 12 customers uh, many of which would ask me to come and do more work at their house which was a blessing but I don't recall any of them ever questioning me on price but every one of them has complimented me on quality uh, and almost everyone on timeliness uh, but I had one opportunity at the end of October uh, with a husband and wife that live in Texas. The husband is business is a vice president of business development of a two hundred fifty million dollar company. So he negotiates for a living, and it took three weeks of negotiating on scope of work and on price before he would agree to proceed to allow me to renovate his house. 
part of that is because the wife had been burned or been hurt. She was very skeptical because they had hired three or four other handymen the past six or eight weeks to renovate their house and they were nothing but disappointed. I felt like they were getting ripped off. So after my first week of work with them, uh, working on their house, like I'm just sending them pictures and videos every day because they're in Texas. Their house is here. Uh, they called me and said, Nick, we're thoroughly impressed. Like they're laughing. They kind of sound little kid-like because they're just laughing in happiness. They're kind of giddy. Uh, I said, Nick, would you please walk across the street to the neighbor's house? There's a blank check there for you that we've already signed. Just write down whatever you need for this week of work. You've blown us away. Uh, which I was, I was thoroughly impressed. I'm like, wow. Like I knew I was supposed to be doing this, but that's just profound. Like they're trusting me with a blank check. They didn't even ask the neighbor to write the dollar figure in. Uh, it was incredible. Of course, I didn't take advantage of that. I was still full disclosure and asked them if I could write an amount on there. Told them why. And, uh, then the wife came into town about a, uh, after two weeks of work and she complimented the quality, complimented the timeliness, but she was steady complaining about the cost. Uh, and I think my prices are reasonable because I'm doing the very best that I can trying to provide for my family uh, and the people that I get to work with and on Thursday morning on my way to her house in my flesh I made up my mind I said if they want me to finish the rest of their house I'll give them two opportunities to take me up on that I'll quote it once if they want to beat me up on price I'll quote it a second time but I'm not going to quote it a third time because I don't want to hassle with price. I'm doing high quality work on purpose. Uh, so when I got there to the house, I spoke with the wife. I'm going to call her Mrs. K. Uh, she came to me almost in tears saying, I love the quality of the work you're doing. I love how expedient you've been. I was really skeptical of you, of you at first because I've been burned by so many other people. Um, I mean, she was quite emotional. Uh, she said, I want you to do everything else in my house. Turnkey. Uh, I was shocked because you heard the resolve I just had that morning on my way to her house. Um, so I said, Mrs. K, what about this? And what about that? And what about these components? You said you could get it done for half of what I said I would do it for. Do you still want me to do that too? Yes, I'm willing to pay more because I know you'll do it right and I won't have to mess with it. Like, she's just going above and beyond. And she, I said, okay, well, no problem. I'll quote you the rest of the, everything just so you know what it's going to cost. Um, no, 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 don't, just do it and I'll pay for it. Just do it. Don't even worry about quoting it first. Just go do it. I know that you're going to be reasonable with your prices. It was amazing. Like, this is the same couple that gave me a, a literal blank check, then they gave me a verbal one. Uh, yeah, it was a... A real big blessing to my heart because I'm like, this is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And one, one key component that I forgot to share was that my team gathered together that morning before we started work on her house and we prayed for her that she would see the light of Messiah in us. That she would see the love of Messiah in us. And God completely gave us favor. It was incredible. So I want to remind you of the three simple steps that we discussed. So we're going to speak life. I've got a verse, uh, Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So we're going to increase our faith and who we are by speaking it. Right? So everybody say, I'm going to speak life. I'm going to speak life. That's right. All right, I got another verse, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate, think on these things. Amen. Step two is we're going to practice control of our emotions. Napoleon Hill says, Nature has endowed man with absolute control over but one thing, and that is our thoughts. Everybody say, I'm going to control my thoughts. I will not be ruled by my emotions. Wow. 
So keep in mind, even if you're going through an undesirable circumstance, remember that you are no less anointed by God. You are no less a child of God. And you're no less in covenant with Him. Even through a difficult situation. So when somebody says, how are you doing? I am well. You can choose whether you're, not, whether you're going to tell them how you feel or you can tell them how you're actually doing. You can tell them what you believe. But by the way, you shouldn't have the negative feelings anyway if you're operating in self-control over those feelings. So the third thing is we're going to walk with purpose. So Miles Monroe says, once you know your gift, you cannot be manipulated by people anymore. You can't be threatened. Right? Once you know who you are, once you know why you're here, once you know that you are filled with His Spirit, your goal, your purpose is to share His love, His light with others, now circumstances don't matter. So if you've ever been hurt somebody by somebody, I'm sure you've had the thought, how could they do that to me? Or how could they do that, do that to that person? But if we're operating in our identity, if we're filled with the Holy Spirit, which we are, but we're intentionally allowing His love, His light to shine through us, we might have a thought such as, if that person's living this way, if they're causing this amount of damage, this amount of hurt, they must really be deceived. They must really be in trouble. They must be crazy lost. Right, so now we can walk in power with our purpose to be able to reach souls. So keep in mind that if we operate with a victim or a villain mentality, if we play that game, nobody wins. But Christ in you, hope of glory, is amazing. Amen. Right? So again, I just wanted to remind you that if you would like for me to send you these resources or if you would like some assistance one-on-one, uh, -on -one, I would be happy to join you on your journey and walking in your purpose. So uh, let's remember to walk in our identity, to fulfill our purpose, and to be blessed. Shabbat Shalom.